Um, hi, everyone. My name is Katarina. I work for uh, North Carolina Wildlife Federation, and welcome to our presentation today on human wildlife conflict uh, concerning reptiles in North Carolina. Um, so, with us today, we have Sarah Zaburchin. I'm so sorry, Sarah. <laughs> She is a rising third year at uh, North Carolina State University's vet program, and she is one of the education outreach coordinators for the turtle rescue team. And she's going to talk to us today about uh, reptile rehabilitation and how to best coexist with reptiles, as well as when to step in and, and uh, help our reptilian friends on the landscape. So, uh, Sarah, I turn it over to you. Um, and thank you. All right. Sounds good. Um, to start off, I just want to apologize, everybody. I'm sorry, my video is not working. I'm on an old computer, and sometimes <laughs> that happens to me. Um, but I'll go ahead and start presenting this. Um, so yeah, I'm with Turtle Rescue Team from the Veterinary School at North Carolina State. I put all of our contact information here, and it'll also be at the end of the presentation in case you guys do want to get in touch with us or ever find a turtle that you need to bring to us or any injured reptile. Um, so essentially, our mission at Turtle Rescue Team is to bring in injured turtles and reptiles from North Carolina um, and we treat them, rehabilitate them, and then release them back into the wild. So the vast majority of our species are turtles, and that's sort of what my talk is going to be focused on. But we do also see um, snakes, amphibians, like frogs, and we see lizards. So we do see a variety of reptiles. It's just that the vast majority of our patients are turtles. So to start off, I'm going to talk a little bit about human turtle conflict and sort of why we see some of our turtles coming into turtle rescue team. The vast majority of our presenting conditions and our injured turtles come in because they were hit by a car. So about 62% of our cases every year are hit by car turtles. And about half of those are eastern box turtles. And I'm going to go through all of our different North Carolina turtle species in a little bit. Um, this is a little gruesome. Uh, sorry, close your eyes if you're squeamish. Um, these are some of our vehicular trauma turtles that we see at Turtle Rescue Team. Um, the left hand side are eastern box turtles and the right hand side are snapping turtles. Snapping turtles are kind of unique because and I'm sorry if you can hear my dog in the background too. Um, snapping turtles are kind of unique because they respond to predators by getting really big and puffing up. And that's a bad thing if you are a snapping turtle that a car is trying to go around and then you get really big and puff up because the back of your shell gets all smashed, unfortunately. So they have this great adaptation to fend off any predators um, or anything threatening to them, but it doesn't really work for a huge car. Um, and while these injuries seem really traumatic um, and scary, turtles are very resilient. And with treatment, a lot of these really traumatic injuries um, can heal and we can release these turtles. So I just wanted to talk about what to do if you do find a turtle on the side of the road and you want to help it out, um, whether it's injured or not. So if you find an uninjured turtle trying to cross the road or in the middle of the road, obviously the first and number one most important thing is your safety. So you want to pull over to the side, make sure that it's safe to get out of your car, and you want to help that turtle across the road in the same direction that it was heading. So if you put it back on the direction it was coming from, turtles are stubborn and they're going to try and just keep going back in the direction they're heading right across the road. Um, so you want to bring them to the other side of the road that they're headed towards. It's not the best environment for that turtle. Um, the turtle knows best and they're stubborn, so they're going to head that way anyways. Um, and another really important thing is not to relocate that turtle. So um, even if you think it's not in the best habitat, the greatest place for it, um, turtles have really, really strong homing instincts. Um, so they essentially live in the same quarter mile to mile radius their entire lives. 
And if they um, move outside of that radius, they're going to do everything they can to get back there, even if it includes crossing roads and um, dangerous obstacles to get there. So it's always best to leave the turtle where you found it, if in doubt. So then some other common injuries and turtle diseases that we get presented to at Turtle Rescue Team and that you might see, you know, with turtles in your backyard or if you go hiking um, or just to some of the lakes around Raleigh. We do see dog attack turtles, so sometimes especially our little box turtles. Um, look like really good chew toys for dogs <laughs> um, and they get chewed on around their shell. Um, and then we also do see lawnmower turtles that get packed up a little bit by lawnmowers in people's yards. Um, other presenting conditions that we see are oral abscesses. So these are turtles that have these swollen ears. They have enclosed ear canals so that they can get these huge swellings on the side of their head. And we do have people that find these turtles in their backyard or um, on walks and they bring them into us. And we don't know exactly what causes these. We think it's a vitamin A deficiency. Um, and we think it could be due to organophosphates in the environment. So things that are used for pesticides and are found in agricultural runoff. Um, there's a theory that that is what is causing these. And essentially, um, when you bring these turtles to us, we drain these abscesses um, and flush them out. And the turtles do really well. And we put them on vitamin A um, for a course of treatment. Turtles also get bacterial and viral infections, just like any other animal. So do other reptiles like lizards and snakes. Um, and people will find these with cloudy eyes and nasal discharge and just generally not moving around like wildlife should. Um, and they'll bring these into us as well. We also see fish hook injuries. So in our aquatic turtles, obviously, um, these guys get fish hooks stuck in their mouths. Um, the severity of this injury ranges from turtles that we can easily remove the hook or they actually can pass it sometimes without any um, trouble. Um, other turtles need surgical removal of these fish hooks. So it really is a case dependent thing, but it's always best to get these kind of turtles treatment for sure. And then this is just a chart showing you guys our seasonality of when people bring us turtles most often. As you can see, we're in our busiest months in the summer when turtles are most active. This is the same for all reptilian species. We're seeing a handful of snakes in our lab throughout um, May and June and July as well. And then it definitely slows down quite a bit in the winter when everybody's hibernating. So I wanted to also just go through some turtles that you might encounter in the Raleigh area, um, the Wake County area, and in the Piedmont of North Carolina. So most commonly and the most common turtles that we see at Turtle Rescue Team are the North Carolina State Reptile, which are the Eastern Box Turtles. Um, you have probably seen these on hikes around if you've been into the woods around your home. Um, one fun party trick is that you can tell males and females apart. So the females are usually a little duller in color. They have these brown or light orange eyes. The males have really bright red, bright orange eyes. And the males have a concave bottom of their shell, which is called a plastron. And the females have a flatter bottom of their shell. So that's kind of fun to impress your friends with that you know the difference between those. And then these are some of the box turtles that present to us that are in our lab being treated. So box turtles are mostly terrestrial turtles, but um, they do need water to hydrate themselves. Um, and they often get that through their skin cutaneously um, by soaking in ponds and puddles in the wild. So, um, they're in, housed in containers in our lab, but for at least 20 minutes a day, these guys soak in water and it's a pretty cute little sight when they're all soaking together. 
And then onto our water turtles. So um, in ponds and lakes, you would see these yellow belly sliders. They're often those turtles that are stacked up on a log in a lake. Yellow bellies have a broad yellow stripe behind their eye. Uh, males have really long nails as well. So that's another turtle that you can tell the males and the females apart from each other. These are some of our yellow bellies in lab. And then here are river cooters. So another aquatic turtle species that can look very similar to yellow belly sliders. They have a thin yellow stripe behind their ears. And then um, they have these open black dots on the side of their shell. These are some river cooters. They also have these really ornate shell patterns and they're a little flatter than yellow bellies. So even though it can be hard to tell the difference, there are some um, helpful hints. So yellow bellies also have solid black dots on the side of their shell and they have these solid black dots by their head um, on their plastron right here. Whereas the river cooters have these little hollow donut shapes on the side of their shells. And then you can also see the difference between the thickness of that yellow stripe on a yellow belly versus a cooter, and also just the difference in the pointiness of their nose and their jaw shape. And we have snapping turtles. These guys can get a bad rap. They um, can really hurt you if you don't know how to handle them properly, but if you do, um, they're very easy to handle um, and move around. The most important thing, I thought we'd talk a little bit, these are our snapping turtles um, from our lab. I thought we'd talk a little bit about proper snapper handling. So if you were, were to see one of these crossing the road um, or somewhere that it needed to be relocated slightly, um, we get a lot of calls about how do I move this snapping turtle. So definitely, most importantly, never pick it up by the tail. Never pick up any turtle by the tail. It is connected directly to their spinal cord and it can cause quite a lot of internal damage. Um, but these people are demonstrating perfectly how to handle and move snapping turtles. So you wanna place a hand on either side of their tail um, on their carapace, that top part of their shell, and just hold on to their shell and lift them across. And you basically don't wanna place your hands anywhere in the front half of their body because they have really long necks. And even if you feel like your hand is pretty far away from their mouth, um, they can turn around and snap at you pretty quickly. So just be cautious um, and just know how to handle these guys and they're um, just the same as any other turtle them. So then we have two more aquatic turtles, Eastern mud turtles. Um, these guys are pretty small and they're generally found at the bottom of creek beds. This is one of our patients in lab, one of our mud turtles. We also have musk turtles that look very similar. Um, I'll show you one of the ways to tell the difference. So mud turtles, if you look on the bottom of their shell, have sort of a K pattern, um, whereas musk turtles have a more continuous bottom of their shell looking. And both of these, like I said, are found like at the bottom of creeks. I've seen them in Umstead Park before. Um, so they're usually well camouflaged, but you, you can come across them. And we do get injured ones into our lab. And then we also have painted turtles, which are another aquatic species. These guys are really beautiful. They're very ornate colored. Um, and they're gonna live in the same areas, oops, sorry in the same areas as our yellow belly sliders um, and our river cooters. And then finally, we have our red-eared sliders. So these are another type of turtle that you might encounter around North Carolina, but they are invasive to this area. So these guys are usually supposed to live around the Mississippi River Basin area, um, but essentially they've been released here and in many other locations um, where they're not native because people had them as pets and then decided they didn't want them anymore and released them into the wild. Um, they do compete for resources with our other aquatic turtles and they do hybridize and mate with our yellow belly sliders. 
So they are considered sort of um, unwelcome guests to our environment and um, they are invasive. But of course we do see them at Turtle Rescue Team. If they're injured, we will treat them. Um, and then, but once they're treated and rehabilitated, we generally don't place them back into the wild. Um, we place them with um, a permanent home that will, they'll be someone's pet for the rest of their life instead. Um, there's also been a project to sterilize some of these um, at the veterinary school through Turtle Team. Um, so that's been interesting and just sort of researching more of um, the hybridization of them with the yellow belly sliders. So finally, what to do if you find a sick turtle. I've talked a lot about our lab and our facility. Um, we have veterinary students on pager from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. every day of the year. Um, so you can always give us a call. Um, we just ask that you transport the turtles to the veterinary school for us. Um, if you're not in this area, there are plenty of other um, wildlife rescues and rehabilitations that do take turtles and know exactly what to do with them. And you can just search for those in your area. Um, and then finally, if you want to help us in other ways, you're not finding sick turtles, but you still want to help. Um, we are definitely accepting donations right now, especially in our busy summer months. Um, we need things like newspaper and scrap papers um, for our homes, for our turtles. Plastic flower pots and yogurt containers are greatly appreciated for little hidey holes like Sebastian up here. And then Tupperware containers with matching lids so we can keep our eggs nice and safe in um, our incubator. And this is just a picture of where we're located at the veterinary school. And this is just our donation box in front of our lab. Um, but other than that, I am open to any questions that you guys have. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, if anyone has any questions, you are more than welcome to raise your hand and speak directly, or you can uh, type your question into the chat. Um, we do already have a question, Sarah. Um, and B Bill W asks, what is the largest alligator uh, turtle you have handled? So I'm assuming alligator snapping turtle, turtle Bill. Um, and are the alligators snapping turtles usually larger than the common or um what do you think that they're about the same size so what have you seen personally yeah that's a great question so we actually don't have alligator snapping turtles in this area so i'm not that familiar with how big they get and i've actually never handled one um they're really cool so i wish i had um but i haven't i do believe that they're bigger than our common snapping turtles that we have around here. Um, but yeah, I'm not super familiar with the alligator ones because they're not native. So it's a good question. Okay, and then the next question is from Tara Moore. What is the smallest species of turtle that you work with? So the smallest species in terms of when they get up to adult size that we work with are probably those mud and musk turtles that I showed you guys. Um, they're, I would say, like um, eight inches long in length about. Um, and so they're the smallest ones that we get as adults. Um, but we also see hatchlings and like baby turtles quite often and those guys can be um, like the size of a quarter. So we handle turtles very, very small to big snapping turtles as well. Awesome. And then Bill W also asked, uh, do you guys interact with the Piedmont Wildlife Center out there? Um, I mean, we do interact a little bit. Um, they'll bring us turtles. And I think we've given them some of their turtles that they have in their education collection, I believe. So sometimes um, when we have unreleasable turtles, like um, turtles that are blind, for example, they can't, they can't be humanely released. Um, and we try and place them with education facilities. Um, so I think we've given some of them to Piedmont. Um, so we do interact with local wildlife centers and all of those around the area. 
Awesome. Um, and then Monty asked, when are you open to bring in an injured turtle? Yeah, so we have a veterinary student on pager from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. So essentially they're the ones that will be answering messages and phone calls during those hours. And um, during those hours, they would arrange for you um, to bring in that turtle and sort of find a time that works for both of you to bring it in. Awesome. And, and Sarah, I have a quick question. Uh, what are some of the techniques you all use in your rehabilitation process? So you showed us a whole bunch of, uh, um, you know, car, car hits and you showed us the abscesses and things along those lines. Do you have different techniques you use? Uh, obviously for the abscesses, you said you drain it, but uh, when it comes to the car hits and, and, and egg extractions and things like that, what are the kind of techniques y'all use? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so with the um, vehicular trauma, we get a lot of broken shells and we do quite a few shell repairs. So we've sort of um, found this way to repair shells using bra hooks and um, wires. So we actually sort of super glue and adhere hooks to their shells and um, oppose the parts of the shells that are broken um, using wires. And we also use paper clips sometimes. Um, and so we basically piece the shell back together and the shell um, is hopefully still living at that point. Um, and it will basically re-harden and it will become vitalized and um, heal back together, which is really cool. It takes a really long time and a lot of those turtles have to be overwintered. So they're kept with rehabilitators um, during the winter months until it's warm again the next year to be released just because they heal so slowly. Um, the shell is made of bone material. So you can imagine how slowly a broken bone heals and then multiply that by 10 times <laughs> slower because turtles have very slow metabolisms. Um, but it's really cool. They are do have really remarkable healing abilities. Um, we also can work with turtles that just have chunks of shells missing. Um, that happens um, with vehicular trauma and other like lawnmower traumas as well. And basically we try and keep that wound as clean as possible and then we'll place sort of like a sticky bandage over it to protect it from the environment. And it generally starts to reharden um, and sort of grow back essentially. So those are sort of our ways to combat the shell trauma that we see from those type of injuries. Awesome. Um, and Bill W is asking, what is the average range of a male Eastern box turtle? And do they have connector or corridor needs? Yeah, um, so as far as we know, the range of the males and the females is very similar. Um, about a mile radius um, and even at turtle rescue team we try and release them in a quarter mile if possible of where they were found um, so they have very small ranges connector corridors I don't know how much um, these have been implemented specifically for turtles um, I think it's a great idea to try and implement these across roads that are connecting habitat in general for any sort of wildlife and um, could potentially work great for turtles um, if they decided to use them instead of crossing the road. Um, so I'm sure there's some really interesting research being done on that. Awesome. And then Tara said, uh, asks, do you have particular areas or wildlife refuges or anything where you like to release the turtles or do you always try to get them right back to where they were found injured? We try and place them right back to where they were found injured. Um, otherwise, like I said, they'll just continue their journey, continue trying to find where they came from and could get even more injured along the way, trying to cross different roads, et cetera. Awesome. Um, and I guess I'll ask another question um, because I, I enjoy turtles myself. <laughs> um, 
And that question just escaped me, oh my gosh. Okay, well, if anyone has questions, wow, that really just escaped me myself. Um, please write them into the chat or raise your hand. I'm gonna to try to remember my question. Um. <laughs> You're good. Oh, there we go. Um, so at what point do you think that the public should step in to help turtles? And at what point do you think the public should leave turtles alone? So um, obviously there's quite a bit of kidnappings of turtles uh, when people think they need help. And uh, what what is the best way to kind of sum up how to help best help the turtle in that situation? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so, you know, I tried to show some of the presenting conditions that we see that are concerning and um, are treatable at um, different rehabilitation facilities. So if you see any of those signs like turtles with respiratory infections, viral infections, oral abscesses, trauma, um, those are all good things to bring to the attention of a rehabilitator um, or some kind of veterinary facility. One thing that we do at Turtle Team is um, oftentimes if people are unsure whether the turtle needs to be brought in or we are unsure as like the case manager of that turtle, we'll ask um, for pictures to be sent to us. Um, and you can just snap a few pictures of the turtle and we can sort of say whether or not um, we think it needs to be seen or removed from where it is. Um, because oftentimes, you know, it's best to not disturb wildlife that doesn't need to be disturbed, of course. Um, but usually when people bring us um, turtles, they are injured and um, do need medical attention. So generally we've seen that the public is pretty good at gauging um, when they need to be brought in. Okay, and it looks like we have another question. Bill asks, can you comment on the use of dogs to find box turtles? Um, John Rucker uses, John Rucker uses of spaniels, sorry. Um, honestly, I can't really comment on that. I don't know too much of about the use of dogs to find box turtles. Um, <laughs> so that's something I'll have to look up after this as well. Um, I'm not sure if they're used. Oh, thank you. Send some info. <laughs> okay. Um, and Sarah, if you could just go ahead and show your contact page for the turtle rescue team. That way, if um, if anyone has more questions and is interested about turtle rehabilitation or just has questions about what to do with turtles, um, they would be able to contact you all directly um, mm -hmm. to be able to get help or, or advice on a turtle that they may be seeing. For sure. Um, and with that, it doesn't look like we have any more questions. Sarah, thank you so much for speaking today. It was awesome. And thank you everyone who attended. Um, uh, this is the last one of our human wildlife conflict series, um, but we're really thankful for y'all joining us and asking questions. And I hope you enjoyed. And Sarah, again, thank you so much. Um, everyone have a wonderful night, okay? Thanks for having us.